Amen. All right. Well, we are going to get ready to dive into week three uh, of the series that we are currently in. Um, For the last couple of weeks, Arian has kicked off this series called In God We Trust for Such a Time as This. And we believe that this is a message and a word that God has been stirring in our hearts um, for this community and for the greater community beyond here, but as the body of Christ, as the church, that we would dive in and allow our roots to go down deep, that this would be a declaration that we make about ourselves as individuals and that we make for us as a church that we will trust God for such a time as this. We're talking about staying rooted, being rooted in our faith when the tides of culture are rising all around us. And we know that the tides of culture are rising all around us. We've talked about the the fact that the Bible is actually filled with people who lived in some crazy times, right? Who lived in societies that were hostile to the people of God. And yet God used their lives to to accomplish his mission in incredible ways as they stayed rooted in their faith and in their devotion to him. So far, we've looked at the lives of Esther and Daniel. Both of them lived in societies that were politically and religiously charged, divided, and hostile to the people of God. And today we're going to look a bit at the life of Jesus and how he came to the earth as well for such a time as this. You know, when Jesus came on the scene, similar to Esther and Daniel, when Jesus came onto the earth, he came to an earth that, that also was very politically divided and charged. Many people, um, God's people, the the people of of Israel, the Jewish nation was waiting for a Messiah to come and overthrow the oppression that Rome had them under. So they were waiting for this Messiah with these expectations that he was gonna come overthrow the government and do what they wanted him to do, accomplish, show up on the scene the way they wanted him to. Anybody ever been guilty of that? We're praying, we're asking things from God, and we have this expectation that we would really love for God to show up on the scene exactly the way that we want him to, right? And that's what it was like when Jesus came to the earth. They wanted him to overthrow the Roman government, but Jesus didn't do that during his time here on earth. Instead, he started building a new kingdom. And he taught things in the midst of building God's kingdom. He taught them things like civil responsibility. When he was asked, should the people of God pay taxes to Caesar? He said, pay to Caesar what belongs to Caesar. He taught civil responsibility, but he also taught pure hearted allegiance to the kingdom of heaven. He came to bridge the gap between God and mankind. Jesus came to bring truth, tough truth. Truth that that would go against what the unbelievers and the believers actually believed at the time. He came to shift perspectives and change the the view that many people had of God, the view that had become distorted and wrong. And he came to bring the heart of God and he accomplished his mission, not just because he was God. We know that Jesus was fully God while he walked the earth, but he was also fully human limited by many of our same human limitations, and yet he accomplished his purpose because he approached it with a specific strategy. And we're gonna talk a little bit about that today because the strategy that Jesus used to to accomplish his mission to get the truth out is just as relevant now in 2024 as it was when Jesus walked the earth and use this same strategy as well. In John 1, 14, we read these words, the word became flesh. Now the W in the word word there is capitalized because it is referring to Jesus, that Jesus is the word. So the word became flesh and made his dwelling among us. We have seen his glory, the glory of the one and only son who came from the father full of grace and truth that Jesus came filled with grace and truth. His strategy was this, that Jesus taught the truth with grace, that he taught truth in love. He never endorsed sin. He never accepted sin, not when he walked on the earth and not now. 
Jesus never glosses over our sin. He never glosses over or turns a blind eye to our self-centeredness, our pride, our sin, so that he won't offend us or hurt our feelings by calling us out. No, he lovingly points us to his word. He lovingly points us and redirects us to the truth, to the better way, to God's way. Jesus never compromised his message, but he always spoke it in love. He didn't just give truth, but he always gave grace with it. He didn't just give grace, but he always gave truth with it. Every single time when we read our Bibles and we look through the Gospels and we see that people had a lot of questions for Jesus, they came to Jesus for clarification on a lot of different things. And every single time somebody approached Jesus with a question, he gave them the heart of God. He graciously answered it. Every time they came and said, what do you think about this law? What do you actually teach about this rule or about this law that was given in the Old Testament? What do you say about these things? He graciously spoke truth by pointing them to the heart of the Father, by pointing them to the heart, by giving them the why behind the what. They had the what. They had the Ten Commandments. They had the rules. They had the guidelines. And Jesus didn't diminish those, but what he did was he gave them the why behind it. He came to share the heart of the Father so that people would know and understand who God is and his love for them and his desire to have a relationship with mankind. And so anytime that Jesus answered questions like that, anytime that Jesus spoke and gave truth, he did it with love. He did it by communicating God's heart. Like when he was approached and asked, Jesus, which rule is the best rule to follow? Do you remember that in the gospels when he was approached and the people asked, out of all the 10 commandments, right? How many of you have been like that? Which rule do I really have to obey so that I don't get in trouble, right? How close can I kind of get to that line before I step over it? That's kind of, you know, the air of this question. Which rule is the most important rule that we really, if we're going to follow any of them, we should really follow this one. And when Jesus was asked that question, do you know what he did? He called the people higher. He called them higher than just, I'm not going to just focus on this nitty gritty. I see where you're going with this. I'm going to call you higher. I'm going to teach you how to know and understand the heart of God, the one who gave these guidelines. So you're not just looking at it as a checklist of things that I'm supposed to do and I'm not supposed to do. You need to understand the heart behind it. He gave them the bigger picture by saying, if you will really just focus on loving God with your whole self, if you will focus on really loving God, and if you'll focus on really loving other people like you love yourself, you know, sometimes we read that and we think, I don't know that I really love myself all that much. You know, we can be real critical of ourselves, but let me ask you, how often do you find yourself thinking about your own desires and your own wants? and the things that you want to accomplish and the things that you want to see happen. And how many times do you make your choices and your decisions based on your own convenience and your own comfort, right? So Jesus is redirecting us to say, if you would focus on loving people, thinking about other people, doing things for other people, the way that we are prone to just think about our own selves, if you would look at that picture, if you would strive for that, then you're going to end up making choices that honor God. You don't have to sit here and get in the nitty gritty, which rule, what should I do? What do I have to keep? What can I let slide? Can we get to the heart of the matter? And the heart of the matter is that God has a better way for you, that God has something so great for you that you aren't catching yet until you fully seek him with your whole heart. Grace and truth. Jesus never waters down the truth. He always calls us to holiness. He lets us know that God's call for our lives is a call to holiness, but out of love, he tells us why. That God's call to holiness for our lives is so that we will avoid a life of getting stuck in sin because sin destroys us. And that's the truth. And that is his heart for us. His This call to holiness is not God trying to stifle all your fun. This call to holiness is a loving call. It's so that we will avoid the destruction that comes with pursuing the things that our sinful nature will lead us to pursue. It's a call to pursue your actual best life, 
You know, we talk about, I, I just want to live in my best life, right? How, how are you doing? Oh, just living my best life, trying to live my best life. Our best life is a life that we find when we follow Christ. That's the truth. That is the honest best life that you could ever find yourself living is one that is lived following Jesus. This was his strategy, grace and truth. And we see it consistently through the gospels, through the Bible, as he ministers to person after person. Grace invited the woman at the well to drink of the living water in John chapter four. Truth lovingly spoke to her about her failed relationships and about her current living situation. The fact that Jesus even had this conversation with this woman at the well in Samaria went against every cultural regulation that was in place at the time, broke down the barrier of gender, broke down the barrier of race, that Jesus was even having this conversation, but he purposely pursued her so that he could meet her where she was at and speak the truth in love to her situation. He begins to tell her intimate details about unhealthy patterns and cycles that she's had in her life, not to condemn her, not to shame her, but to let her know that he knew and he had something better for her, that he had actual true satisfaction, healing, and life that could be found in him if she would be open to it, grace and truth. It was grace that washed the disciples' feet. Truth told them to go and do as he had done. Grace met Nicodemus at night. Nicodemus was a Pharisee who really started getting curious about the message that Jesus was teaching, wanted to ask him, but couldn't be seen in broad daylight asking him these questions. And so the grace of Jesus met Nicodemus at night, away from the scrutiny of the other Pharisees so that he could wrestle out some of these doubts and some of these questions, but truth told Nicodemus that the only way to get to heaven, the only way to have a relationship with God was to be born again. There was no other way. Grace told the woman caught in adultery in John chapter eight that he didn't condemn her. Truth told her to go and sin no more. Truth does not have to be compromised. It just needs to be communicated and lived out in love and from a place of grace. In Ephesians 4, 15, we read this, speak the truth in love, growing in every way more and more like Christ, who is the head of the body, the church. Another translation, the ESV words it this way, speaking the truth in love, we are to grow up in every way into him who is the head into Christ. In this context, this verse is a part of a passage of scripture that is talking about church unity and spiritual maturity. So what we're reading here is that speaking the truth in love is actually part of growing up spiritually. And how many of you know we're called to grow up spiritually? We're not meant to just continue to stay spiritual babies our whole life. We come to know God and we just stay with what we know. This is what we know. We're called to grow. And part of growing in our spiritual lives is learning to speak the truth. It's learning to address and approach the hard and heavy, but from a place of love and from a place of grace and to see how these two can work together as Jesus models for us. Because on the flip side of that, we have to realize that it's immaturity to have one without the other. It's immature to just live from a place of love. Well, I'm just all about love. I'm all about love. Somebody else can tell you the truth. I'm just gonna love you. I'm just gonna love you to Jesus and never speak any truth to you. It's not effective in the Bible actually calls it immaturity. Also to be the truth, I'm gonna get on my soapbox and you're gonna know what I believe and I'm gonna tell you what I believe and there's no grace or love. It's immaturity. Doesn't accomplish what Jesus is trying to accomplish. We've got to promote what is right with the right attitude. That is how we mature and grow up in Christ. We're living in times when the truth is being avoided for the sake of nobody getting offended. When people don't want to actually address the real truth that the Bible talks about, but the truth doesn't change. God's truth, what we're referring to when we say the truth, just to be clear, is the word of God. And this truth doesn't change with culture. This truth doesn't change as the tides of culture are rising. So it is going to be offensive sometimes because our culture keeps changing and our culture keeps trying to push things that are wrong and keeps trying to call those things that are wrong right. They're trying to normalize it. And so the truth is going to be offensive. 
at times. We can only have a right way if we acknowledge that there's also a wrong way. So when, when your parents and, and, you're, and you're training your kids, right, we acknowledge, we understand then we want to teach them the right way. We want to teach them that it is not okay to put their hand on a stove. Even if your truth is that that little stove is just not going to be hot and it's not going to damage my hand and that's your truth and you just think it'd be the coolest thing in the world to touch it, the actual truth is that it's going to burn you right? The actual truth is that there's going to be a consequence. And so we got to train them the right way because there's also a wrong way. People all around us are searching for truth, desperate for real answers, because we live in a culture that doesn't give real answers. We live in a culture that's filled with the fluidity that anything goes, that whatever you believe, it's okay that you can just have your truth and we can all hold our own truth. But that kind of reality never gives you stability. And so there's nothing to grab onto. We can't get a grip on our lives when everything is fluid. We have to come back to the truth. But if we're not careful, we can become deceived by this line of thinking. We can become deceived into thinking that biblical truth is kind of offensive, right? And we have to guard our minds and our hearts against that because this truth spoken in love is the only way to freedom. This truth spoken in love is the only real hope that we ever have to offer anybody. And we're living in a world that desperately needs hope. And if we are going to become more and more like Christ, like we're called to become, then we have to follow the example that Jesus set for us, that our Savior set for us. Jesus says this about himself in John 14, 6. He says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one can come to the Father except through me. It can kind of be an offensive statement, right? When you look at it, like through the lens of what our culture might look at that sentence and say, it can be offensive to other cultures, to other, to other religions, that Jesus is saying, it is only through me that you can receive salvation. It is only through me that you can get to heaven. That might offend some atheists, right? Might offend some people that are following another God, worshiping another God. And yet he still says it because it's true. There is only one way to the Father. There is only one way to salvation. There is only one way to heaven. And it is through Jesus. The point isn't staying away from hard topics because they're hard. The point is to enter them as the Lord leads in grace and in love. So as followers of Christ, when we talk about the truth, it can never be with an air of condemnation. That's not our place. That's not what God calls us to. Again, that is immaturity. And we can end up doing a whole lot more damage than we ever do good. We have to follow the example of Jesus and enter these conversations because it is our responsibility to have them, but enter with love and with the grace of God going with us. We've got to talk about these topics for such a time as this because we are living in the midst of them. And we've got to be able to be the light and have the answers that the world is searching for. So as a church, When we talk about things like there is only one way to heaven, when we talk about things like there is only one way to salvation, there is only one way to establish a relationship with God, and it is through Jesus. That the Bible says that you're either for Jesus or you're against him. There is no neutral ground. That if you're of the mindset of saying, well, I believe in God, I'm just like not the crazy fanatic that's actually going to follow him, then you're actually against Jesus. That's what the Bible says, that there's no neutral stance, that you're following Jesus or you're not following Jesus. It's just that simple. And we don't say it with condemnation or arrogance. We say it with the love of saying, figure out where you're at and decide where you want to go and where you want to be according to the truth not according to the deception that you're hearing in culture. When we talk about things like like this, like you can't pray to crystals and to Jesus because it's two different things. You're opening yourself yourself up to two different spiritual worlds, to two different spiritual realms. It's not the same. Spirituality, which is real big right now, and Christianity are two different paths. One is following Jesus and the other is following a counterfeit. 
And you've got to know that. You've got to know the truth. When we talk about things that all religions are not the same, that all paths do not lead to God, that all paths do not lead to heaven, that it's okay if you believe this and it's okay if you believe that because you've got faith. No, that's not the truth that we find in the word of God. So when we talk about that, when it comes up in a conversation, you can address it as the Lord leads you with truth and love. Actually, just a few weeks ago, I was sitting with a lady and she was telling a story and she was talking about a time when she had prayed and she made the statement of like, yeah, I prayed and I don't remember if it was like to Buddha or to Jesus. And I just, you know, felt just that little check right away and just very graciously said, oh, because, you know, that's not the same thing. It's not the same thing if you pray to Buddha to pray to Jesus because one holds no power and the other holds full power. You'll never get an answer from one, but you'll always get an answer from the other. It's not the same thing. And we can enter those conversations lovingly from a place of grace because it's love that wants people to know the truth, to find the truth, to find that transformation. When we talk about things that have become politically charged topics, but really they're issues of morality, It's not from a place of condemnation. It can't be from a place of condemnation. It's from a place of love. When we talk about abortion and how it's wrong because the Bible tells us that life begins at conception, that God knits us together, that he sees us, that he has a plan for our lives when we're hidden in our mother's womb. And so when we talk about the fact that abortion cannot be a viable option for followers of Christ, in any situation, in any circumstance. It's not from a place of condemnation or throwing shame. It's from a place of wanting you to know that there's a better way, that there's a better option, a better alternative. When we talk about homosexuality and the fact that it goes against God's design for sexuality because we see that all throughout the word of God in the Old Testament and the New Testament, We do it from a place of love, from a place of saying there is a better way. There is a better design. When we talk about sex outside of marriage being sin, it's not from a place of just being judgy. It's from a place of saying God has a better way. God has a better design that is for your good. That is life-giving. When we talk about the fact that children and teens should not be given the right to change their gender, or to mutilate their bodies because there is only two genders that we find in the word of God and it's male and female. We do it from a place of truth. We do it from a place of love because the enemy is coming in with so much confusion when God clearly sets our identity and to acknowledge that that's okay, it's okay if that's their truth, is to acknowledge that God makes mistakes. But when we read Psalms 139, that in detail, tells us that he formed us in our mother's wombs, that he saw us, that he knit us together and saw all the days of our life before we ever took our first breath, speaks of a God of purpose, speaks of a God that created you on purpose for a purpose, and he didn't get it wrong. And he didn't get it wrong for anyone out there that's struggling. Are they struggling? Yes. But should we let them change? Should that be what our country goes to? Should that be what we as believers just kind of fall? I don't know how to bring it up. I might offend somebody. I don't know how to talk about this. God has a purpose and the purpose and the truth ground us. The purpose and the truth allow us to find freedom and to find hope. So when we talk about these things in church, It's never with an air of condemnation, not in this house. And that is our commitment to you. It will never be with an air of condemnation. It will always be from a heart of love, from a place of wanting people to recognize where they are and to know that there is a better way. It will always be with a scriptural backing, a loving why, with the heart of the Father at the root of all of those conversations And it will always be with a heart for people who have already made choices maybe down those paths to find the healing and the hope and the freedom and the restoration that they need because God provides that. We have to talk about the truth. It's truth in love to talk about sin 
because sin carries painful consequences. And when we open ourselves up to sin, we open ourselves up to the enemy. And we know from John 10, 10, that the devil only ever comes to steal, kill, and destroy. So when we give him access to our lives by opening ourselves up to sin, by opening ourselves up to these different ways of thinking, when we open ourselves up to the enemy, you better believe that he is coming in to steal, kill, and destroy from your life. You better believe that he's coming in to wreak havoc, that he's coming to cause turmoil mentally, emotionally, relationally. He's coming in to steal from you, destroy, bring destruction. And I'm not saying that if you're going through a storm right now, it's because you've opened yourself up to sin. So please hear me. Sometimes we just go through hard things and there isn't a reason. But I am saying that if you are allowing sin to remain in your life, there will absolutely be consequences and pain and chaos that result from it because the Bible is clear. When we give the devil access, he comes to steal, kill, and destroy. We have to deal with sin. We have to address it and there is a way to address it. We can't turn a blind eye to the truth because it's uncomfortable or because it might be offensive. That's why we have to know the truth and we have to understand what the Bible says so that we can communicate it in a loving way. When the Bible is telling us to speak the truth, let me tell you what it isn't referring to. Okay, it is not referring to your own personal truth. It is not referring to our opinions. It's not referring to our preferences or to the popular opinion of culture or influencers. So when we're hearing speak the truth in love, it is not just give your own opinion whenever you can and try to do it in a loving way. No, it's talking about the word of God. This is where truth is found. It's found in the word of God. This is what can be a lamp to our feet and a light to our path. This is what guides our steps and what guides our way when we're entering into conversations, when we're making our decisions, when we're deciding who to allow into our lives, who to date, who to be friends with, when we're deciding what we're gonna watch or listen to, this should be the guiding light. This should be the lamp to our feet. When we're making big life decisions, this is what gives us wisdom and directs our path. When we go to vote this November, this is what should be guiding our decisions. This is what should be guiding our choices and our ways. And we're not gonna talk about who you should vote for, but we're going to encourage you and we're gonna challenge you. Will you let it be through the filter of God's word? Will you pray about it? Will you establish your convictions based on what you find in the word of God? Will you take the convictions that you already feel passionate about and will you run them through the filter of the word of God? Because this is where the truth lies. This as followers of Christ is what is meant to guide our path. Every step that we take, we don't find it from other people. We don't find it from social media. We don't determine our choices, even from our family or our background or any of that. We gotta do it through the word of God if we're gonna follow him forward. If we're gonna walk in his example, if we're gonna grow up in Christ, we've gotta commit to the truth. We've gotta let it lead our lives. And when we do engage in conversations, when we do feel prompted to bring up some hard truth, I want you to hear this verse so that you will know how we are called to communicate it. 2 Timothy 2, 24 through 26 says, a servant of the Lord must not quarrel, but must be kind to everyone, be able to teach and be patient with difficult people. I think we could all just like take that verse right there. A servant of the Lord is called to be patient with difficult people. How many of you can be challenged by that verse all week long, right? Okay, a servant of the Lord, this is what we're called to. It goes on to say, gently instruct those who oppose the truth. Perhaps God will change those people's hearts and they will learn the truth. Then they will come to their senses and escape from the devil's trap for they have been held captive by him to do whatever he wants. From these two verses, we find three profound yet simple truths. One, it's that God is the one who changes hearts. It doesn't say perhaps you'll change them. It says perhaps God will be able to change their hearts. We speak the truth in love, that's our responsibility. God is the one who changes hearts. 
It is not on you to get somebody to change. It is your responsibility. It is my responsibility. Our call is to speak the truth in love. Number two, that those who are lost in deception can come to their senses, but it's never gonna be through condemnation. They're never gonna see the truth through shame. It's always gotta be through love, but this is why we don't ever stop praying for people. This is why we don't ever stop loving people because they can turn around. They can come to their senses and be open to the truth. And the third thing is that the key is truth in love. It's what keeps our conversations gentle, kind, and filled with patience. And how many of you know that when you're in a conversation with somebody, patience can get lost real quickly, can it? In hard, tough conversations. But the truth in love is what keeps us there, is what keeps us having conversations that honor God. So I wanna give you this visual. When we're talking about the truth in love, because here's what ha can happen so often. We can decide that we're gonna be the people of truth. Man, we're gonna give the truth of God each and every time that it is an opportunity is presented. I'm standing on the truth. I'm gonna give the truth. This is what my life is gonna be known for is living by the truth. But when we make truth the central point in our life, love kind of just gets lost down here by the wayside. So then, so then, you know, let's look at what about when we make love the central point in our life. And I'm just, I'm gonna be the one who loves. I'm just always gonna love no matter where someone's at, what they're saying, love is gonna be central in my life. But then truth gets left down here by the wayside. We're called to truth and love. So how do we do that? The only way to do that is by keeping Jesus central is by lifting Jesus up in our lives. Because when we lift Jesus up and we keep Jesus central, then truth and love both come into proper alignment. When Jesus is lifted up in our thoughts, in our conversations, in our pursuit, then we're able to operate in truth and love respectfully. We bring the truth, we don't compromise the truth, but we do it from a place of love. We give it with grace. We speak it with grace. We live it with grace, but only when Jesus is central, when he's the one exalted, when he's the one lifted up, we've got to keep Jesus lifted up in our lives. The world is so filled with confusion right now. And when we live in a, in a society that, is, that runs rampant with confusion, we got to run to Jesus. We've got to run to the word. We've got to stay in the word. We've got to ground ourselves in the truth of the word so that we do not get swept away in confusion, so that we do not get swept up in deception and the lies that, that are half truths that sound really believable, even for the people of God, right? The word says that the love of many will grow cold as the time goes on in the earth. And we see that happening to so many believers that our love, that our passion, that our fervency for the Lord is growing cold, getting replaced by distractions and busyness. We gotta lift Jesus up in our lives. We gotta know the truth. We gotta be in the truth. And if you don't know the truth, get in the word. If you haven't spent much time in this, then can I say you probably got some misconceptions about who God is? You might have some misunderstandings about what it means to be a follower of Christ. This is where the truth is found. And this is the only truth that can set you free. This is the only truth that can bring you fulfillment and satisfaction. No other pursuit, no other pursuit that you chase after will ever bring you the kind of satisfaction and fulfillment that will come with lifting Jesus up in your lives. This is an example that Jesus set and he calls, it, he calls us to it for such a time as this for the season, the day and age that we are living in the earth today, the season of life that you find yourself in, this is the call that we would trust God, that we would speak the truth in love for such a time as this. And we do it by getting to know the truth, by getting in the word. We do it by believing and receiving His love, by opening our own hearts up to receive His love, by extending that to others, and by keeping Him first place in our lives. It's how we follow his example. It's what we're called to do. Every single one of you are here for such a time as this. Do you believe that?
Do you believe that of yourself? Do you believe that God saw you in your mother's womb before you ever took your first breath and saw all the days of your life and had purpose for it? Because that's the truth. He has purpose for your season right now. I wanna end just by reading one more verse because if we're gonna commit to be people who walk the truth in love, we gotta get this verse into us right here. Paul says this in Galatians 1.10, obviously I'm not trying to win the approval of people, but of God. If pleasing people were my goal, I would not be Christ's servant. We have to commit. Who are we going to try to please more? Who are we going to lift up more? We can't be all love and no truth. We can't be all truth and no love. We gotta lift Jesus up so that we can walk in truth and love. Would you just stand to your feet with me this morning as we end? You know, I wanna tell you all day long that God has a plan for you, that you are here for such a time as this because I believe it with my whole heart but you have to believe it for yourself. And so if you wanna make that declaration over yourself today, I'm just gonna ask that you would put your hand on your heart and that we would just say this together, that we would declare this over our lives together, that I am here, I am here, say this with me, I am here for such a time as this. And I will lift Jesus high. I wanna pray for you, God, thank you for the example that you set for us in your word. Lord, I pray that we would be people who commit to lifting you high in our lives. Lord, you said that as you are lifted high, that you will draw people to yourself. God, I pray that we would see ourselves the way that you see us. God, that we were created on purpose and that we are filled with your purpose to live on the earth for such a time as this. God, I pray that we would grab a hold and seek you for that purpose. God, that you've called us to help build your kingdom, that you've called us to be the light of the world that we're living in, to be dispensers of grace and hope and love and to stand on the truth. God, I pray that we would find the freedom in our lives that comes only from you, that comes only from opening ourselves up to the truth of your word. Lord, I, I pray for those in here, God, that may not have a relationship with you right now, God, or maybe it's been a while and they've wandered and their hearts feel far from you. Lord, I thank you that you are the God that receives us, God, graciously every time we come to you. And Lord, so I pray for those right now that don't have a relationship with you, would you draw them by the power of your Holy Spirit? Would you draw them by your love? Would you make it so real to them, God, that you see them, that you love them, that you desire a relationship with them? If that's you in here today and you don't have a relationship with God or you don't have an active relationship with God, the Bible says that if we will confess with our mouth and believe in our heart, that Jesus is the Son of God, that He paid the price on the cross for our sins, that He rose again, that we can receive His gift of salvation. So I'm just gonna lead you in a prayer that's, that's just that, that takes us through those steps. If you would just repeat this after me, dear God, I know I need a Savior. Today I open my heart. Thank you for sending Jesus to pay the price for my sins that I couldn't pay. I ask for your forgiveness. I receive your forgiveness. And I ask for you to come into my heart and be my Lord and Savior. And I will follow you forward with your strength and grace in Jesus' name. Lord, I pray for all of us in here, God, who are followers of you. Lord, I pray that you would just strengthen us and stir us up, God. I pray that we would not get so distracted, Lord, that our relationship with you gets left by the wayside. But God, I pray that you would stir us up to know that we are here on mission. God, that we are here with a purpose for such a time as this. Lead our conversations, Lord. Let them always be seasoned with grace. Let us speak with love so that we can give an answer, God, to the people around 
around us for the hope that we believe in. I pray that you would open up conversations even this week, God, in front of us. Lord, lead us by your spirit to enter them with love and grace, presenting truth and hope. Thank you, God, for shaping us, for molding us to be more and more like you. Take us to a deeper place of spiritual maturity. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. Amen. Amen.